You know what? We're done with crying. We spent the last few episodes on some heavy emotional shit, tugging heartstrings and jerking tears, but now we think it's time to slap some knees. These are our picks for the top 10 funniest movie moments of all time. How do you break down humor? It's something we all experience, but most of us probably couldn't explain it if our life depended on it. I mean, give it a try. What makes something funny? E.B. White probably put it best when he said that analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. Few people are interested and the frog dies. But we're in the business of frog murder here at Cinefix, so get your lab gloves on because we're going in. The first of three prominent theories of humor is called relief theory, and it comes to us mostly by way of our favorite phallic symbol smoking German psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. In it, he slots humor into his existing theories of Depression and psychic energy as a release valve. According to Freud and his ilk, we've got all this pent up energy from clenching our buttholes, repressing our sexual and aggressive urges, and humor lets us blow off some much needed steam about it without letting go of those defenses. A joke, then, is something that looks like it's going to take even more energy to repress our urges, maintaining our emotional or cognitive stasis, but it veers away at the last second and we laugh at the relief. Think Blazing Saddles' sheriff self hostage situation. The next man makes a move, the next gets it. Where a clever backdooring theoretically allows us to revel in racial aggression in a scenario where the actual social stakes are rendered artificially low. Or Dr. Strangelove's famous outburst, where the psychological tension involved with having to explain why the doctor has suddenly stood up out of his chair is instead quickly waved off as a miracle. What a relief, we don't have to resolve that conflict. It's Buster Keaton and Steamboat Bill Jr. miraculously threading the needle through a window as the house falls, sparing him from harm, and our emotional shock that might have had to go with it. And it's Little Miss Sunshine, when Olive's family gets on the stage with her and spares us the immense discomfort of her embarrassment. But for our first pick, we're going with the infamous diner scene reveal from when Harry met Sally. Most women at one time or another have faked it. Well, they have her faked it with me. How do you know? Because I know. It's just that all men are sure it never happened to them, and most women at one time or another have done it, so you do the math. You don't think that I can tell a difference? No. Get out of here. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Are you okay? Oh. Now the most famous part of this scene is obviously the end. I'll have what she's having. And that seems to function as a social awkwardness relief too. But we want to talk about the moment when Harry first realizes what's going on because it's pretty perfectly Freudian. We're already laughing and having a good time from Harry and Sally's fake orgasm banter where there's clearly some awkwardness and repression that goes unreleased. How do you know that they're really... And released. What are you saying? That they fake orgasm? When Sally starts acting strange and Harry is first concerned about her health. Is she okay? Is she choking? He doesn't quite know what's going on and we don't either. But then it becomes clear. No, she's not choking. She's faking an orgasm. It's a near miss. It looks like we're heading towards danger until we veer off towards sex land. And this backdoors Harry and us into a sexual experience. In this context, the whole scene is really a release valve for their sexual tension. They get to use humor to express the feelings they're repressing without committing to them. It's funny because it allows us to get our metaphorical rocks off without the actual stakes, which sounds a whole lot like flirting to me. Of course, the relief theory isn't exactly perfect. It's pretty obvious that everything relieving doesn't end in laughter, and it doesn't seem like it's capable of explaining all jokes either. Enter superiority theory. The idea behind the superiority theory of humor originating all the way back with Plato and Aristotle is that we laugh because we get an opportunity to experience our own superiority over another. This is the classic pratfall, why tripping can be funny. Our superiority can be physical, intellectual, certainly social, or even emotional. We see someone else behaving like a fool, and our laughter is joy at our own not fool. Coolness. Think the can scene from The Jerk. Stay away from the cans! The cinema line from Annie Hall. What I want to give for a large sock as with a horse manure in it. And most of the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie. La violence ne mène à rien. 
It's schadenfreude on screen like Jackass's golf course, Pineapple Express's chase, and something about Mary's zipper. A superiority theorist would say when Harry met Sally is actually funny because we know what's happening before Harry does, and we're identifying with Sally by the time she proves she's more orgasmically knowledgeable than he is. But for our number 9 pick, we think that the Princess Bride's Battle of the Wits is an example as perfect and hilarious as they come. You've beaten my giant, which means you're exceptionally strong, so you could have put the poison in your own goblet, trusting on your strength to save you, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. But you've also bested my Spaniard, which means you must have studied, and in studying you must have learned that man is mortal, so you would have put the poison as far from yourself as possible, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. You're trying to trick me into giving away something. It won't work. It has worked! You've given everything away! I know where the poison is! Then make your choice. I will! And I choose... What in the world can that be? What? Where? I don't see anything. Oh, well, I, I could have sworn I saw something. I thought no matter. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. First, let's drink. Me from my glass, and you from yours. <laughs> you guessed wrong. You only think I guessed wrong. That's what's so funny. I switched glasses when your back was turned. <laughs> so the big punchline is pretty obvious here. Vizzini is convinced he's outsmarted Wesley, our hero, until he falls over dead. Pretty obviously wrong. And who doesn't want to feel superior to the blithering, bragging, boasting, self-proclaimed genius? We just want Wesley to shove his own words back down his smug throat. So when he does, Boy, is that a big kick of superiority humor. And sure, it's also a relief, but it gets even better for superiority. What is he doing right before he croaks? Laughing. And why is he laughing? Because he thinks he's bested Wesley. That's right, we got some meta superiority humor up in this bitch. Classic. Superiority isn't quite a catch-all either. Who are we feeling superior to with this joke? The Supremes would have hit the top of the charts with this really big one in the 60s. We're not sure. And why are we laughing at this poor sad sap? Not sure either. So next up, we got incongruity theory, the reigning humor theory king, championed by those famous comedians Kant, Schopenhauer, and Hegel. It suggests that humor comes from the realization of an incongruity, a mismatch between our expectations and reality. In comic terms, the setup creates in us an expectation while the punchline subverts it, and the humor lies in the moment of realization, the instant of collapse between the imagined and the actual. This is young Frankenstein's putting on the Ritz. If you're blue and you don't know where where to go to? Why don't you go where fashion sits? Or in Glorious Bastards Italian, where the infiltrating bastards are far worse at their language than the German they're trying to fool. Buongiorno. It's puppet sex, or an accidental Hitler speech, or an awkward, skinny, dorky boy named McLovin. Incongruity theory would tell you that the Princess Bride moment is funny more because Vicini's proclamations of his own intelligence are so wildly out of whack with reality than because we like how smart he makes us feel. It's almost every single joke that you'd look at and call ridiculous or absurd. However, for our number 8 pick, there's no incongruity more delightful than the Black Knight's refusal to acknowledge his obvious defeat from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Victory is mine! We thank thee, Lord, that in thy mercy... Ah! Come on, then! What? Have at you! <laughs> you are indeed brave tonight, but the fight is mine! Oh, had enough, eh? Look, you stupid bastard, you've got no arms left! Yes, I have! Look! Just a flesh wound. As the duel proceeds, we are continuously confronted with the Black Knight's denial. Each time he gets a limb chopped off, he downplays its importance. But each time he has one less limb, so the incongruence is much worse, and the laughs much better. So it heightens and it heightens the absurdity of the bit, turning what was a possible comeback into a hilarious farce, and yet he persists. And we love it all the more because it's such a human kind of denial, with machismo and pride so tragically misplaced as to be hysterical rather than grating. There's a brilliant, shameless inconsistency between his reality and his proclamation, and for that very reason, it's impossible not to love it. 
but we're a bit in the weeds here with the theory. We've got seven more slots, and we want to spend them looking more at the technique of humor than the philosophy of it. And the good news is that cinema has a ton of different ways to tell a joke. And probably the best one to start off with is dialogue. In a nutshell, it's wordplay, where the text itself contains the humor. The relief, the superiority, the incongruity, they're embedded in the language. Think Life of Brian's Biggest Dickus. Wait, your biggest dickus hears of this? Or Ghostbusters Dickless. Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. Airplanes jive. What it is, big mama, my mama raised no dummies, I duck a rap. Blazing saddles harumph. Naked guns fireworks. And how could we not mention the all-time classic, Who's On First? But if it's clever verbal banter you want, our preference goes to the now and then insanity of Spaceballs' video review. What the hell am I looking at? When does this happen in the movie? Now. You're looking at now, sir. Everything that happens now is happening now. What happened to then? We passed then. When? Just now. We're at now, now. Go back to then. When? Now. Now? Now. I can't. Why? We missed it. When? Just now. In the same way that a pun is funny because it's a word used for an incongruous meaning, where the language choice conflicts with normal expectations, here they're doing something similar with the words now and then. They use each word to mean multiple different things. Sometimes now means at this moment on the tape, and other times it means at this moment in reality. And then they never use them in the same way at the same time, such that their use is always incongruous. And then they repeat it over and over and over, rapid fire like 80 times in a row, constantly shifting the meanings back and forth. Never on the same page until everyone's in stitches and no one knows what time it is. Of course, sometimes it's not about the words they're saying so much as the underlying silliness behind them. Switch up the language and the punchlines still land. That's because our number six is not wordplay, it's situation comedy. The silliness lies in the core conflict. Some improv comics call this the game of a scene, the fundamental funny thing about what's driving the action. The incongruity isn't in words and meaning, it's in wants and worldviews. This is life of Brian's gang of men playing women pretending to be men so they can stone to death anyone who so much as dares to say Jehovah. Sorry, I thought we started. It's Django and chains KKK mask bickering. No, nobody brought an extra bag. Or Super Troopers cat game. All right, now. Or Naked Guns baseball pat down. <laughs> it's any scene where the description of the scene itself is hysterical. And for our number six pick, we're going with His Girl Friday's introduction of Bruce Baldwin. Well, I can see right away my wife picked out the right husband for herself. How do you do, sir? Must be some mistake. I'm already married. Already married? Oh, Hilda, you should have told me. Well, Pardon. congratulations again, Mr. Baldwin. Oh, no, <laughs> Mr. no. My Burns. name oh, is... Oh, excuse me, will you? I'm terribly busy. Just leave your card with the boy. What did you say, Mr. Baldwin? Mr. Burns. My name Mr. is... Mr. Burns. Some other time. I'm busy with Mr. Bruce Baldwin here. I didn't but hear what you said, Mr. Baldwin. I was Baldwin. going to Excuse say that my name Now, look, what is it with you? I'm Am I? Bruce Can't Baldwin. you see that... Oh, you're Bruce Baldwin. Yes. Well, who is he? Who are you? My name's Pete Davis. Well, Mr. Davis, is this any concern of yours? No. Well, from now on, I thank you to keep your nose out of my affairs. The underlying game here is that Cary Grant's Walter has mistaken his ex-wife's new fiancé for a very old man, and he's so fixated on impressing this wrong Bruce that he keeps brushing off the right one. And while the dialogue is great, it's not what's on display here. Instead, it's the three-way case of mistaken identity playing out fast and dirty right in front of our eyes. Is there incongruity? Check. Superiority? You betcha. Even relief theory would point to the final biggest punchline as a relief and avoidance of the emotional toll of apologizing to the old man. But the three leading theories of humor had damn well better be able to look at one of the funniest scenes ever shot on film and declare it what audiences around the world already have. Goddamn riot. Some comedy scenes are just A-OK -okay in the dialogue and structural sense, but then along comes a brilliant comic actor who delivers a performance that seemingly turns a base hit into a home run. It's not what they said or what they're doing, it's how they said or did it that offers us some of that comic relieving, superior, or incongruous madness. Think of Will Ferrell and Anchorman. Ah! I'm in a glass case of emotion! And his telephone booth scene is a funny idea, and it's got some clever lines, but could you imagine anyone getting as big of a laugh out of his delivery as him? Or what about Jim Carrey in The Rhino in Ace Ventura? <laughs> Bill Murray telling his Dalai Lama tale in Caddyshack? Gung -gung. Gung -gung -gung. Christopher Guest naming nuts in Best in Show? Peanut. Hazelnut. It's moments of Jeff Bridges' Lebowski, Steve Carell's 40-Year-Old Virgin, Joe Brown and Jack Lemmon at the end of Some Like It Hot. They're all funny scenes elevated by absolutely magical performances. But the best of all has to go to Peter Sellers, President Merkin Muffley on the phone with Soviet Premier Dmitry Kissov and Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Well, now, what happened is um, one of our base commanders, he had a sort of 
Well, he went a little funny in the head. You know, just a little funny. And uh, he went and did a silly thing. Well, I'll tell you what he did. He ordered his planes to attack your country. Uh, well, let me finish, Dimitri. Let me finish, Dimitri. Well, listen, how do you think I feel about it? We consider picking this scene in the last category because it's such a brilliant idea on its own, but there's something extra magical about Sellers' performance that takes it to the next level. The incongruity is clear. What if two heads of state actually chatted on the phone like a married couple, planted in a giant, officious underground war room, and the contrast is even clearer? But the shy, hesitant, tentative sensitivity of Muffley just flies so far in the face of everything we think of as presidential that we can't help ourselves from laughing. Sellers plays him like a waspy soccer dad who'd be uncomfortable running a PTO meeting, much less a country, with an uncomfortable whine and just a hint of a stutter, and it absolutely makes the scene. While dialogue, structure, and performance are all tools that give us humor driven primarily by the characters, that's not the only way to make a joke. Because while most movies don't have actual voiceover narration, they're narrated nonetheless. The camera, the editing, the sound, the music, these are all the voice of the cinematic narrator. They're just visual and sonic rather than verbal. And the narrator can make jokes too. One of our favorite ways a narrator can make a joke is through clever use of the camera. The punchline isn't just what's happening, but how it's being shown to us. The trick is in the telling. Think sight gags like Top Secret's boots, High Anxiety's Crashing Dolly and Austin Powers' Nudity. There's A Knight's Tale's Feet, Dodgeball's Sign, and Men in Black's Chaotic Background. Sandberg falling through a serene frame in Hot Rod gets us every time, as does 21 Jump Street's Tripping Balls, and pretty much everything made by Edgar Wright. But for our favorite sight gag, we think that This Is Spinal Tap's Stonehenge is just too f***ing much. When we get the actual uh, set, when we get the piece, it'll, it'll follow exactly these specifications. I mean, even these contours and everything. Um... I don't understand you. Uh, but I mean, the actual piece. Well, when we, I mean, when when you build the actual piece. Uh, but this is what you asked for, isn't it? What? And oh, how they danced, the little children of Stonehenge, beneath the haunted moon, for fear that daybreak. I come too soon. What a perfectly silly camera angle. Sure, the punchline is embedded in the scenario, but it's the camera that delivers it, mischievously framing the miniature as it lowers hesitantly over Christopher Guest's unsuspecting shoulder. We're superior because it makes a fool out of Guest. It's incongruous with his expectations. And are we getting any relief? I suppose it's relieving the emotional investment that would come with a big epic set piece, but however you want to interpret it, it's excellent visual comedy, which is enough to make this slot on our list. But it doesn't just have to be the camera that makes the visual jokes. Editing can do it too. And could you imagine a better engine for incongruity than the uniquely cinematic instant juxtaposing machine that is the edit? Is there anything more perfect for smashing together the unexpected for a sudden laugh? It's the classic smash cut. Someone says, I'm not ever doing that. And then boom, they're already there. Now, what am I supposed to tell the press? Uh, training exercise. Isn't that the usual BS? It's not that simple. An unfortunate training exercise. But it can also be as simple as a reaction shot, as in the producer's Springtime for Hitler or 22 Jump Street's Ice Cube Daughter reveal. Zoolander builds jokes out of a walk-off montage. Austin Powers combines editing with dialogue for double entendre. And Monty Python and the Holy Grail mucks about hilariously with a castle charge. However, for our number three pick, I don't think we've ever laughed harder at a cut than in Bruce Almighty's broadcast sabotage. A potential scandal with the Buffalo PD surfaced today when the mayor... <coughs> What the man demanded that the chip? What the man demanded that the chip boy? As a response to allegations, I'm sorry, I seem to have something stuck in my mind. <coughs> 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 Okay, at first glance, you might want to throw this in with a performance or scenario for its humor. We definitely did too. But our test involved paying attention to ourselves as we watched, noticing when we laughed hardest and then asking why. And for us, we laugh hardest here. The astonishingly perfect lip syncing of Jim Carrey's mouth with Steve Carell's gibberish just kills us. And here we are again, looking at an obvious basic incongruity. Jim Carrey's mouth is moving, but Steve Carell is talking. And far more than the superiority of the Bruce Evan relationship of this scene, we react to the incongruity of cause and effect of movement and sound. And that punchline, that's right there in how it's cut, between picture and picture, and between picture and sound. 
If you're not suspecting it from our last pick already, in addition to visuals, audio can contain our punchlines too. And nowhere is this more obvious than in the score. Whether it's Shaun of the Dead's Don't Stop Me Now, Dr. Strangelove's We'll Meet Again, every music cue in Team America World Police, Uncle F***er in the South Park movie, or the Big Lebowski's intro to Jesus. However, for our number three pick, we've got to go with the Office Printer Massacre from Office Space. Back up in your ass with the resurrection. Is the group harder than an erection that shows no affection? They want to ban us on Capitol Hill. If you haven't already gotten tired of us sucking all the fun out of funny scenes by analyzing them to death like our frog, you can probably pretty easily identify the pattern of silliness here. It's hilarious because of the mismatch between the music and the scene itself, incongruity style. And this is a pretty common music trope, this playing against the scene. But it's interesting to note that it's not always funny when it happens. Compare Office Space to this. Not, uh, not the same vibe. So what gives? Not to keep harping on these different models, but it seems like the relief theory has a pretty clear answer. Office Space's scene is funny because the action provides us a silly relief from the aggression of the music, whereas there's no such relief in the torture of the girl with the dragon tattoo, which maybe reveals something deeper about these three competing theories. Maybe they're not really competing at all. Both these scenes pass an incongruity test, but only Office Space passes a relief one, while Dragon Tattoo fails with flying colors. So maybe the truth of humor is that while you may only need to secure an A plus in either the relief, the superiority, or the incongruity, you can't just flunk a whole category and still expect to graduate to laughter. And finally, arriving at number one, we've reserved this slot for perhaps the OG source of cinematic comedy. Originated largely in 16th century Italian theater, we're talking about physical comedy. Think slapstick, think Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton and Jackie Chan. It's the Pink Panther and Wallace and Gromit. It's Lebowski's Door, O Brothers Fall, and Young Frankenstein's Priest. Our second favorite runner-up here is Kung Fu Hustle's knife scene. But for our number one pick, we've got to give it to the Marx Brothers mirror routine from Duck Soup. Yeah, 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 we know. We're big film hipsters for picking a comedy scene that's older than your grandma for our top slot, but did you watch it? It's f***ing hysterical. Look at them work their craft. It's absolutely incredible the amount of work, precision, and choreography that went into this sequence. And it's so long. It has its own narrative arc. It's not just one joke, but one after another, after another, nonstop. It's got relief, superiority, and, in our favorite part, a serious dose of incongruity, all without a single word or phrase. And most of all, above the technical, philosophic jibber-jabber of dissecting our frogs, it absolutely slays us more than 80 years later, which is why it's our pick for the funniest movie moment of all time. So what do you think? What's your favorite comedy moment? Do you disagree with any of our picks? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe for more Cinefix Movie Lists.